hopefully everyone can hear me all right. I'm sure someone will let me know if you can't. Um, so yes, we're going to do pumps and facilities and force mains. We're going to cover everything. Here's the bio for me again. I've um, been doing this um, for a little while. I'm the sanitary product manager. Uh, I am now officially a father of three. If you've been following along, that number has been um, going up. We'll just uh, round it down to three. Since we're doing pumps, I thought I would show you a lovely picture of me back in my early career days that has pumped um, animal sewage, animal waste. Um, and uh, I survived, I think. I don't know. Something may have happened there uh, that's lingering still. Okay, so let's get um, into the series. Like Nicole said, we're in number four of five, so we're chugging right along. We've done an introduction, kind of a generalized introduction. We did a whole uh, webinar just on wet weather because it's sanitary, so wet weather is important. We did one on calibration last time, and now we're squarely on pumps. All we really have left is what we're loosely calling validation, and we've kind of been inferring will become kind of a grab bag of whatever people want to know or didn't hear enough of up to this point. So I say you can comment. You've got one more chance to comment. Uh, feel free to comment however you want, but if you don't comment this time, it's not going to make it in the next webinar. Uh, as I mentioned, we had several to go. Um, we've already done, pardon me. So here's our uh, copies of the first, second, and third presentation. If you go in and register for the next webinar, you also get kind of a neat collection of all of them all at once. And I bet you can guess where the link to the fourth presentation might be if you're good at extrapolating, which all of us sanitary sewer modelers are good at extrapolating. As I mentioned, the third presentation was on calibration. A couple of the major comments on calibration. One was related to guidelines. So um, two resources here. One is kind of the more academic theoretical, and that's a book called Rules for Responsible Modeling. If you Google that, you will find it. And, um, and so that kind of gives you more ways than you want to know on how you can compare your results to actual data. So kind of more from a practical statistical means. So if you're looking at it from that uh, point of view. If you're looking at it more from the um, practical you said 10%, but who are you? You're just a guy with strange pictures in your presentations. I want to be able to show something to my client or supervisor. Then there is a uh, planning utilities group or planning users group, um, WAPUG. And uh, so I have a link here, a short link to what I believe to be one of their more recent documents. And in that, you will actually find some very similar numbers to what I had. So if you want what is the dry weather flow average and peak that they suggest as a as a you know more of a co cohort of users instead of just me? Um, then take a look there. It's not going to be anything wildly different, but it's easier to ref something like that if you're looking for it. So that's some good comments there. Another comment kind of on the canonical definition of validation. So we had some people who uh, rightfully said, well, I I don't treat validation the way you did. And so if you recall. Or, or if you weren't in the last presentation, I use the term validation as kind of a singular check of a model to see if it's physically valid. In other words, if I run a model and under dry weather conditions, the lift station floods every single day, it's probably not valid. So if you don't like that, then you should take the word validation and convert it to verification if you prefer that. So that's just verifying the model works. Because there is another definition of validation that is to say, after I've calibrated, so when I calibrate, I'm turning knobs to make the model represent physical conditions. Then I'm going to point this model and validate it by pointing it at another part of the system. Um, and I'm not going to turn any more knobs. And I want to validate that my calibration works. So it's kind of a further calibration. So uh, certainly um, that's also a, a pretty well-known use of the words. So don't want people to get tripped up in the language. But I'm also one that harps on language, so I don't want to be hypocritical. So um, that was another comment, so I'm glad someone pointed that out. And I have this. This is, if you recall, if you were involved in the last one, and one of the questions we had was, how do you actually calibrate a model? Because you need to calibrate against some actual data. So these are the results just for you to see that, um, and I say we, editorial we, because I'm a modeler myself, we um, only have actual data is about 50% of, of, of all usages. Um, and a quarter of it being more historical field intuition. Uh, it's in good order. In other words, the order you see there is also the order of how useful the data actually is. Uh, and of course, there's all kinds of different 
times to model and different needs. So that's the end of our review of what we've done in calibration. We'll do something similar in the next webinar about any comments or anything I get wrong on pumps. So let's talk about pumps. Um, Semi-ironically, I have a positive displacement pump there, which we're not going to talk much about, but um, I like the graphic. I should state, if I don't mention exactly where something came from, you should assume that it's an um, open commons Wikipedia, which this is as well. We'll start with a quick overview, again, making sure we're all on the same page as far as um, uh, definition language. That's just one slide just to center ourselves on what we mean when we're talking about pumps and some of the very close in appurtenances of pumps. And then a lot of what we're going to talk about is the difference between reality and the model, both from in the important features of each and then examples of each. We'll do that at looking at the pumps themselves. We'll look at storage facilities, at the force mains if the pump has a force main, and at the controls to make the pumps actually do what you want them to do. And then at the end, we'll cover more demonstrations of how we can actually model what's going on there. We've just found historically that a lot of times the first thing someone does is get into the model and then they are presented with a pump dialogue and that's when they decide to consider how to model a pump. And I would submit to you that you're much better off to do the work ahead of time and then work um, in the model as little as possible in, in the pump sections, independent of the modeling platform you're using. We're going to try to be fairly agnostic to modeling platform until, of course, we get to the demonstration part where we'll cover a little more on how XP Swim handles things. So let's start with a qu super quick review. Two main types of um, pumps and lift stations. Uh, you may hear lift station or pump station kind of interchangeably depending on where in the country you're from. Um, this is what would be called um, like a wet pit or wet weld uh, lift station. And you see here, if you can see my mouse, two um, centrifugal pumps. Um, the green little guys down there, they are submerged. To the right comes in gravity flow, theoretically. It doesn't have to be gravity flow, but water comes in, drops down, fills up this wet well, and then you see a level indicator to tell when the pumps to turn on. It looks like to be one right here, the low level, and then maybe the high level or alarm. These pumps have no suction level. They suck directly in to the centrifugal pump and then discharge out and up. Here we have some um, valves and some controls, and off we go into a force main, likely a force main here, and the controls for that pump are uh, above. So some access here to shut off and route what's happening. Otherwise, if you want to access the pumps, you need to pump them dry and pull them out with the crane. Very common, if you notice, um, not a whole lot there. So a lot of people are um, maybe surprised to see how small the footprint of something like that is. The other common one is very similar, except for we've moved what was a submersible pump. In this case, this is still a centrifugal pump, but we've now moved it into a dry pit area here. So whereas before the uh, pump pulled directly from the water, now we actually have a suction line in, and we're pulling in. Otherwise, the same principal difference here is this is generally going to cost more and take more space to put everything this way, but it provides you easy access for any pump maintenance because you're right there. You're not having to pull a pump out of the wet well. So again, we see the suction line. We see some level indicators here for the controls. We see probably a gravity line in with a drop down, and um, then we see the discharge lines here and a lot of different valve structures. And then, of course, the motor, too. When, when I say pump, obviously you need a motor to drive that pump, and that will become important here in a little bit. So that's kind of the super quick review. These are slides from, I think, the overview webinar, but wanted to just touch base again so we're all on the same page, what we're doing. Okay, so let's talk a little bit reality versus model. Um, a little tongue-in-cheek here, right? But uh, so let's see the difference. So here we've got a another centrifugal pump, you see there's a lot of centrifugal pumps uh, in a sanitary modeling just because of all the solids and, and um, other floatables and such that we don't want to clog up the pump. Here you have one that looks like it could be mounted to a skid with the motor. So that's obviously one version, and then we have the dash line, right? So we know one of those is the model, and one of those is reality. And um, I think that in trying to collapse down reality into a model, sometimes we just don't uh, don't get all the way there. And so I would say you really want to think about the function of what the pump is trying to do, not the form that it presents itself in. And by that, a function, I mean that no matter what we're trying to do here, we're consolidating down to effectively head, which is just how much we're going to raise the incoming uh, liquid, the flow, you know, how much of it we're going to push out, 
and then to a lesser extent you might have speed and then of course logic. How are we going to control when the pump operates? So let's talk about that from the reality standpoint. Here's another example of um, a submerged uh, pumped wet well. Again, really small footprint. They put a, a cover on that and put a gate around it and there's really not much to see once it's been built. So what kind of choices are we making in the reality? And I'm no designer, so I'm not going to sit here and tell you these are all the choices you need to make, but these are some choices that end up happening um, either were, were already made and you're now living with the consequences of them or are being made in the midst of your planning in your modeling. One is the pump location, again, where you'd be submerging the pump or not. Um, displacement type, we've shown a lot of centrifugal uh, pumps. You could do positive displacement that does occur to a much lesser extent. Um, so the displacement type of the pump. The motor speed, is, the, is it a variable or fixed speed motor on that pump? Orientation, um, you know, potentially you might have a change, maybe a value in horizontal or vertical, um, although not quite as often here as you might see in water distribution. And some other pertinences, especially if you're doing positive displacement, but you might have a grinders or grinder pumps or screens, rag bars, things like that. Right? Lots of things involved in the nitty gritty of actually designing the station itself. Okay, so let's get a little bit deeper into the reality of that. Um, again, you see uh, on the right there, submerged centrifugal pump, on the left, uh, dry centrifugal pump. So configuration, um, we almost always see our pumps in series, excuse me, in parallel, um, and that being one pump is next to the other. Uh, when I say series, uh, don't get confused if you have a pump station that, or a lift station that lifts even directly into another lift station. That's still not in series in the um, concept of how pump curves operate. So when I mean series, I mean pump pumping directly into the back of another pump. You'll see that a lot in uh, maybe groundwater systems. Um, if you have a water distribution system that's fed on groundwater, you might have really low uh, flow high head pump to get it out of the ground and then that pumps into a different pump. But in the sanitary world, it's almost always in parallel. That has implications you'll see here and how the pumps operate. Similarly, the station itself, both of the examples I saw I showed you in the quick overview is what's called a duplex pump station, which means there are two pumps. You can infer what triplex means or even what a quadplex system means, it's just basically how many different pumps operate in parallel. So in a very simplified example, uh, and if you recall from wet weather, um, the pumps uh, operate under two different conditions. We have this uh, normal or dry condition, and this is the duplex system, very simplified wet well on the left, pumping into two pumps. In a normal condition, one pump will pump into a force main, uh, into a combined header, and then into one force main. Uh, and then it usually cycles for reasons of just keeping the pumps operating, making sure all their um, electrical components and starts are working, testing them, giving them equal amounts of wear on the impellers, things like that. So it may cycle every time, it may cycle daily, but you're going to switch to a different pump, and at some point you're going to switch back again. So you're just kind of back and forth operating that. Well, when there's a wet weather event, now you're suddenly faced with a lot more volume in your um, facility, and so then you're going to run both at the same time, theoretically. So, um, and, you, and you should think to yourself, um, if I have two pumps that are exactly the same, those two um, icon pumps are exactly the same, and I turn both of them on, how much more flow do I get than if I turn one of them on? Well, that's a good question, and that kind of leads into pump curves and system curves, which if you don't do a lot of sanitary or pressurized system and general modeling can be, um, can be something new to you. So I wanted to do a poll. And because I'm devious, it's actually going to be more of a quiz. So I'm going to ask um, three questions, and, um, uh, and we'll just have the results. And uh, let's do the first one. We're going to launch this. So this first question is um, system curves and pump curves. Are they dependent or independent of each other? Um, choose the best answer. There are always edge cases, and um, if you're like me, sometimes you like to find those out. We're not looking for that. We're looking for um, the generalized. So we'll close that, um, and I'll share the results. So the, the question was, I'm going to make sure I'm reading the question the way you got it. System curves and pump curves are independent from each other. Um, generally speaking, now, 
if I tripped you up on the wording, my uh, apologies. Generally speaking, yes, they're independent of each other. By that I mean um, a system curve exists whether you put in a pump of one size or another. There's no difference. The pump doesn't really affect what happens to the system curve. And on the other end, the pump that you put in there will be treated, you know, based on whatever the system curve is. Now, the operation, they're dependent. So how the two interact with each other, we'll cover that. So if you were thinking there, there's some results, then I can understand there being a, uh, um, a question there. So let's see if I can get the other one. All right, second question. How many system curves? And apologize if we haven't, if you're still kind of not there exactly system curve is, we'll cover that. But how many system curves, generally speaking, does a single pump station have over its life? For the purposes of life, assume 50 years, assume a long life. So we have a, a system there for, um, for a while. What happens at system curve over time? Yeah, I'll close that and share that. So practically speaking, it is infinite. And just so for reference, system curve, the easiest way to think about that is um, for any given flow, so don't, don't concern yourself with where the flow comes from, but if I run flow through this section of my model, how much head will um, will there be in both the static lift part of it, if I'm pushing it through there, as well as the dynamic part? How much head loss do I have? So generally speaking, the more flow I put through, the more head loss I'm going to get, and that's a response over time. Now, that's not to say that 20 years from now, it's always going to be a steeper or a flatter curve. Just generally speaking, that curve changes over time. It's not a static figure. Last question on the other end of things. Manufacturer supplied pump curves are correct. We'll go through, there's several different ways you can model a pump in SWIM 5 and XP SWIM. Um, what's called the dynamic head pump is kind of the gold standard of what most people use, and that requires a pump curve. And a lot of times you can get that from a manufacturer. I suppose you can quibble with what correct means, but so if you haven't voted yet, suppose I mean uh, you should trust that explicitly. Pretty even, 50-50. I should check and see how many people work for pump manufacturers. Um, all right, I'm going to close it, and I will share that. Eh, it's 50-50. Uh, generally speaking, of, of the range, and we'll cover the range of different data you can get, manufactured supplies pump curves are great. They're much better than many of the alternatives. Um, just like system curves, however, over time they can change uh, for a lot of different reasons, and we'll cover that. So I would say I would trust it and use it, but I would um, make sure that I've uh, verified it, use the right terminology there, verified that. All right. That's good. So let's go in a little bit more about this pump operation. So a lot of times what you'll see is a curve, and on one axis you'll have head in, in some unit of distance, so let's say feet, that's generally what I see, and then flow and some type of flow rate, let's call it gallons per minute. Pump curve for a dynamic head pump looks something like this, which is to say that you can't have everything, right? As you get um, more flow, you provide that at less head, or said a different way, as the head goes up, uh, you provide less flow. In a very simplified version of that would be the concept of a nozzle. So if you have a garden hose and you stick your thumb in the end of it, you're going to get more pressure or more head, um, but you're going to get less flow out. This is, again, very simplified version. The other version is, uh, um, hold on a second, generally speaking, this is the system curve, thing goes up like that. Um, if you remember geometry, the, the point is where two lines cross, and so a lot of times what happens is we get that point the purpose of the previous uh, questions is to kind of infer to you that that point changes over time. So what does that look like? Well, let's say the system changes. So a good example might be um, the simplest one is that your force main over time maybe tuberculates a little bit, gets a little rougher. Well, your system curve is going to start to bend up a little bit. It's going to become kind of less efficient, which means over time if you change nothing and the pump never changes, you're still going to put out less flow because the system curve changed over time. Maybe the other way, maybe you um, do something and you um, put a parallel force main in or you put in a manhole in a different location and, and change where the force main is or even something as simple 
as um, changing even the, the static lift somehow. You reroute it. We could also change it this way where notice that we might be putting out more flow, but we're putting out a lower head. Now, that's usually more important in the pressurized water systems of the world. If you remember before, I said there's a, this idea of static lift. That's kind of this little area down here. That's basically saying if I need to put water 100 feet up a hill, no matter what happens, if I'm putting a drop of water or a million gallons a second in, I'm still lifting it 100 feet. That ain't ever going to change. But then you get to this more dynamic based on what's actually happening with the flow, and that's where you get this range of system curves. So system changes happen, right, in reality. Pump can change too. So when I told you before, what happens if you have one pump and you add a second pump, even if the pumps are the same, um, this isn't the greatest example. I tried to get this to line up more, but for the individual um, flow, uh, at the same head, you're going to get double the flow, but look at the system curve. Here I am operating with one pump right here. Here I am with two pumps. Notice I only added just this little bit of flow, and there's more head to push it through that, that force man. So that can be surprising to the first-time pump modeler that we um, put in a second pump of the same size and get basically nothing out of it. Um, so you need to do work to see what happens. and. The opposite can be true also, where perhaps you get it perfect for two pumps running, and then when you change that to one pump, um, the configuration of the wet well and the pump itself really horribly operate. They're, the way they operate doesn't work well at all. There's one thing we haven't covered, we'll cover it in a few slides, is um, efficiency of these pumps, really important. But just know that that's more dynamic than you may at first think. Okay, so on the modeling, so I remember way back on the on the... Um, reality salary covered, some of the different things uh, you might think of. So on a modeler, things of a pump, uh, it doesn't really matter to us if it's submerged or not. Right? But we would want to know, is the head dynamic or static, um, how it operates? Um, how are we rating um, this pump? Is it going to be on like a node depth or maybe a volume basis? We might care about the motor type because that would have an impact of um, if there's a different speed of the motor, have an impact there and how we model it, and then logic. How are we going to control how this pump runs? There, there is a pump we'll talk about that has no logic in it, basically, but generally speaking, there's some logic in how a pump operates. Okay, so if you hearken to um, SWIM 5, EPA SWIM, there are four basic types uh, in the model that you'll be presented with, and these will carry forth to XP SWIM. So consider these four types, and I'll show you the type, kind of what it's based on, the curve type, and then some typical where it's located, things like that. So type one is based on the wet well volume. It's an incremental curve, generally speaking, uh, and it's typically an offline system and the, the, uh, the motor speed is fixed. You see the little, uh, on the top right, you can see a little diagram there. You basically would find the volume of the wet well, follow that up, hit the curve, go over to the flow. That's one way. Second way they call it type two. That is similar, but instead of wet well volume, we're not this inlet node or wet well node depth, everything else being the same. So you just notice we took volume and subtracted it, moved it out to depth. Okay. That's another way to do it. Now we have type three, which you can see this curve is the same curve we showed in the previous slide. So this is where we take the outlet and inlet head. We take the difference between the two. That curve is generally continuous. Uh, and again, location speed. Final type is what we call a static head, um, where we have an inlet node. We have this depth, but it's not two different water surfaces compared to each other. It's just a water surface in the invert, otherwise similar. So two and four are similar in, in their approach. Uh, and then you can see sometimes you have a variable speed on them. So those are the different four different types on the EPA swim world. We're not going to get into too much on the EPA swim world. Um, we'll show you how that works in the XP swim world. So the logic per time step, this is the partial logic for pump number one. You would find the wet well volume, and then you would hit that curve, find the pump flow. The pump would flow that out for that time step. The same time step, water would flow into the wet well, and then you'd reach the next time step, which you would get a new wet well volume. You'd follow the curve and the pump, et cetera, et cetera. So every time step, volume, flow, and you continue happily down the trail. So notes here. Interestingly, there's no start and stop level with this. However, you can use a, val a value of zero. So if you have a flow of zero, the pump is stopped, right? But you don't have an effective, no matter what happens, the pump stops here. Uh, just kind of colloquial speaking, what we've seen, not a lot of people use this. Not a lot of people have a volume and flow curve, although it is supported. 
Next option, logic here will be similar, so step through it. So instead of the wet well volume, we're going to do inlet depth, same idea. Hit the curve, get the pump flow, that's what's going to be removed from the wet well. Uh, and then uh, anything goes in, going into the wet well. I suppose you could also have overflows, but it's just general um, mass uh, balance per time giving you a volume. Similarly speaking, you're not going to have a start or stop level and a value of zero. Uh, difference here, or an extra note here, is that under low flow conditions, this is kind of a neat feature, the pump will automatically reduce the flow. By that I mean if the pump should be pumping, let's say, uh, 200 gallons per minute, and the flow is 100 gallons per minute, even though there's not a, um, a stop, the pump will not pump 200 gallons per minute. It won't draw itself dry, which uh, physically is good. That's cavitation or getting close to it, which is not something that your pump is going to want. Your impellers will not thank you for getting air in there. Um, and it's just kind of a nice uh, feature. And so I'll take a side step here and say that there is the idea of the ideal pump. And this is a swim five idea, which is to say, let's say you're doing really basic planning. And I just know that I have a low spot and I want the flow from this low spot to go to a high spot. That's all I really care about. I just want it to go there. At some point, I will determine a really good facility, a lift station, wet well, all of that. But for now, I just want the flow to go from the bottom of the hill to the top of the hill and continue down its merry way. Well, that's called an ideal pump and swim five. It's just real nice. It's real quick and easy for, for planning. Well, this would be your best bet to um, model something similar here where you can just have have a high flow rate, and when the model, when the inflow gets lower, it will just reduce to the inflow level and push it through. So that would be your best bet for doing that kind. And of course, you don't really need logic in that instance. It's just going to take it and kind of pass it on through. Number three is this dynamic head, which is taking the difference between upstream and downstream, or downstream and upstream, I should say, plotting that in the curve and getting a pump flow. Very similar idea. Of course, you're going to have small variations as we kind of shift up and down the curve. Um, and this is a really popular pump option. I have a note here basically saying in the quadrants, uh, this is positive and positive. In other words, I need to have a positive head difference for the pump to operate. That's kind of what that note says. So that's kind of a preview to a gotcha that we have. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the pump data, this is dynamic head pump data. So I'm going to show you getting in better. So sometimes you get nothing, right? You have absolutely no data um, where maybe you need to switch to um, pump number two, just put it through there. Or, I mean, I've seen instances where you've got, you may ask, like, how do you have no data? Well, there are some areas, and maybe you uh, work in one or live in one, but there are some areas that aren't that big that have hundreds of lift stations, and the documentation on hundreds of lift stations isn't that good. So you have to start making assumptions based on single lift stations. So that's kind of the worst case, and it happens. Uh, a little bit better would be horsepower, and a lot of times this will come from people working in operations. Well, they'll know the pump based on the uh, nameplate to be um, a 50 horsepower pump. Well, the problem is horsepower is related to flow and head, so you've got two unknowns in one equation, and so you need to make some assumptions to try to convert horsepower into something useful on a pump curve. But it's better than nothing. The next level would be what I'd call design point, which is you're actually given the head and the flow. So ideally, I have the ideal curve of system and pump, the dot where they connect, it's at you know x gallons per minute and y feet of head. Um, that's kind of the next best. Then you can get these three point or let's say multi-point curves, which just stretch out beyond. Because again, and as the um, system curve changes due to flow and other things, the pump is going to move up and down on its pump curve. So the more you can cover the pump curve under normal conditions, the better results you're going to have. Cover that in a little bit of the first demo. What's even better would be factory testing. This gets into the question I asked, which was, you know, manufacturer supplied pump curves are really good. This is a very typical one where you're going to see um, different impellers and different pump curves based on those. And then you see different... Um, you see an efficiency curve, so you can see, um, you know, maybe which one, maybe it's the, you know, Series G is the one that works best for you. And so now you've got a whole range all the way from no flow to run out. I'll use this to show you, uh, actually I'll use the next one. So the, the last one, the best one you can get, which costs money, that's how everything works in the world, would be actual field testing, because consider factory testing, um, to get everything the same, you know, your pump is going to be run at the same uh, water temperature, viscosity, 
uh, everything about it is going to be the same as everybody else's pump. So if you live in Nova Scotia or you live in Miami, it's run the same way, um, but how it operates for you is different. Plus, over time, you're going to get wear, wear from different things in the system that are going to change how your pump actually operates. Here's an example of just a simple uh, pump performance where you're actually getting flow and head, so you're actually able to measure that. Um, that's the, the gold standard. It's hard to do, but it's good to get. I'll use this example to show you two other things of note, um, and that is the concept of the shutoff head and then the pump run off, run out. Pardon me. So if you think about a pump, uh, maybe you think about yourself. If you're a pump and you're, um, and you're maybe a better example, like you're lifting weights, you're trying to lift a heavy weight, there's a certain weight um, above which no matter how much you try, it just isn't going to happen. Well, that's my example of the shutoff. So in this case, if I hit 18 feet ahead, the pump isn't going to operate. Effectively, the system is pushing the flow down on the pump so hard that it just can't even turn over. So you may have a pump where you add that pump, and remember the pump's in series, you add the pump and actually no extra flow happens because the system curve raises up to a high enough head that just shuts that pump off. You see this a lot with missized pumps. So you have two or three pumps that are not the same, and one of them operates at a lower head. And so when the first one turns on, the second one never turns on, just can never produce any kind of flow. The other end of the spectrum is if you don't have any head, the pump just runs out and basically can't produce much of anything. It's trying to add flow, but there's no head to it, which is kind of sitting there spinning over and nothing's happening. Both of those are not ideal. I can tell you, no matter what your pump looks like, it's not made to be efficient at either end of those spectrums, so it's not ideal to have a pump running that way. Final one we'll cover here is this idea of a static head pump, and this is just looking at the upstream water depth, again, curve and pump flow. So uh, notice the curve is kind of in inflected over what the other curve look like. Um, um, this is nice, though, in so much that it, it's just going to pump. So you're not going to be able to shut this pump off due to head. It's just going to happily try to do whatever it can do. There are a couple other miscellaneous pump types. Um, that are in the wild and supported by um, XP Swim. Variable speed pumps, two ways you can do that. You can use incremental pumps, or there's actually a special control item for those. And then you may have a pump that is controlled by some sensor that is not directly next to it. In other words, it's not the wet well right next to it. It's actually connected to a wet well you know, at a pump station somewhere else. That's also something that you can do. Okay. So here's my summary. So reality, in the real world, you have all kinds of different variables that make up what you think about in reality. And you have all kinds of variables that make up what you think about in a model. And the intersection of which is what you, if you're doing a model, should care about. And I will greatly simplify those to say there's basically two things you need to worry about. You need to worry about the head and flow and potentially speed relationship of your pumping system and the settings when they're on and off. That's pretty much it. So quickly get into the wet well. Discussion. Uh, so the very simplified purpose of a wet well, and if you hear wet well, that's basically just the storage at the lift station. So not, it's bigger than a manhole, it's some kind of storage. So the very simplified purpose, I would say, is cost and operation. Um, cost both in pump efficiency and um, system storage, that you can provide storage there. Um, there do exist in some systems inline pumps, they're just pumping whatever goes through there but through um, getting your operation done right um, and getting expected results, um, a wet well is a really nice thing to have operationally. So I say reality versus model. Here you see a picture of this is actually um, off-system uh, sanitary sewer specific storage connected to a wet well, um, which can happen. So the wet well is basically under my feet when I took this picture, and then it has this kind of connection. So here we have a massive amount of storage, so you can expect a lot of infiltration and inflow here. Uh, and then you have that versus, okay, that's what it looks like in real life. What does a model care about? Again, a model needs to be able to see um, where you are in time. So you may see something like this at Swim 5. Uh, in fact, this is the same one. You see the little guy at 10 feet of wet well, and then another 18 feet of that thing connected to the 10 feet. So uh, obviously, there's simplifications made in what the model uh, looks like versus the wet well. So then we have force mains, and this has been a comment before too. Do we have to have a force main? No, you don't. Uh, you can have a lift station, especially if a very deep lift station, potentially lifting, let's say, 30 or 40 or 50 feet up and then discharging to a gravity line. The pump discharges directly to gravity or through a very small section 
in the gravity. Uh, however, if you have a pressurized system, that's called a force main. Simplified versus I say here is to defeat gravity, right, from one cost or another. You, it makes more sense to pump this thing and not be impacted by physical limitations than it would be to treat it, let's say. Um, and so you're going to have this force main. Again, the idea of reality versus the model. Of course, in reality, you're going to have all kinds of appurtenances and casing and thrust restraints and plugs and valves versus the model, simplifying that down into some expected behaviors. Um, in the swim world, XP and EPA, and, and everyone's really, there's a different set of equations that generally guide how, um, uh, how water moves dynamically through the system, and they hold for both uh, gravity and pressurized flow. Um, but there is a different set of equations for purely pressurized. So every once in a while I get a question from someone saying, I have a totally pressurized system. Can I use XP Swim to do that? Um, it gets beyond really the intended purpose of XP Swim. That's when uh, something like uh, XP Water, some newer product we're putting out that is specifically for uh, pressurized flow. Uh, and that comes in a case with attenuation. So this is something I tell people often. Uh, if you model under normal conditions and you seal all the manholes and you run this, it will be modeled in a very elegant, dynamic way, which is to say you'll have attenuation and routing through your force main. Well, in the world of purely pressurized modelers, that doesn't make any sense. They assume that the pipe is completely full all the time, and if you put a drop of water in on one end, the drop of water comes out the other end. There is no real attenuation that goes through. So usually what we'll say is um, I would model it the default way by sealing all the manholes, putting in your... Manning's equation and running it that way. If you have actual meter data downstream and it, you seem to not be matching the peaks the same way the meter is, then you may consider modeling it as a special force main. Um, and if we have time and you have interest, we'll show that in the demo, demo here. Um, it usually needs to be a bigger diameter force main. So if you have a 6-inch force main, you probably won't notice a difference. If you have a 30-inch force main, you may notice a difference. Just kind of a side note there. Final thing we'll talk about is logic. Um, and so a simplified purpose here is just really to make smarter choices, right? We want the model to make smart choices on what it's doing. And again, as with everything else, reality is much more complex than a model. So in reality, even for some of the more basic lift stations out there, there's usually SCADA and a PLC and there's sensors. There's all kinds of information, a lot of data being uh, collected. Although I will say from the um, acronym SCADA, the uh, data acquisition part is usually much secondary to the supervisory control, but that's a different uh, that's a different webinar for a different day. Versus, say, the EPA five saying, "Hey, it it starts at six and it's off at one." Really simple, because what does it, the model really care about? The, mo the pump just needs to be running or not somewhere on its curve. Real simple there. Different types of kind of covered. Uh, so you can have simple level sensors, sometimes even mechanical, just saying like, if the water touches this level. This pump's going to be on for a certain duration, or it'll be on until it touches this level when it'll turn off. So very robust and simple. And then you can get into some of these uh, um, computer-driven ones, or maybe they're it's SCADA based on levels, a little more refined level, or perhaps you have a variable frequency drive, and it's trying to flow pace, in which case perhaps you have a mag meter or some other type of meter, ultrasonic meter perhaps, um, just downstream where you get a nice uh, more laminar flow, or at least not quite as turbulent from your appurtenances, and that's what you're metering off of. Um, so there's some pretty advanced uh, lift stations out there. It just all depends on what you're doing. And again, a lot of that is really um, dissolved down into something more simple for the purpose of uh, modeling. A couple gotchas. So I have the benefit of being involved in a lot of the um, questions that users have um, with their models from the sanitary standpoint. So we kind of put our heads together here and said, well, I think we can cover like 85% maybe of the, the general problems people have with one slide. So this is the, uh, the slide for you if you've had some gutches before. First thing, I'm going to go to the input page of XP Swims Pump. Looks something like that. Um, and if you remember, we had four different types of pumps. Well, there they are, one, two, three, and four. So remember, we said wet well volume is not one a lot of people use. So anything inside the number one box, if you don't do wet well volume, don't worry about it. If you don't do depth and, depth and node, don't worry about it. Remember, both of those don't have start and stop anyway. So there's no point in doing depth and node and trying to put in start and stops. It doesn't make a difference. Then you see dynamic head and static head. They're very similar. The computation is different, so you have the box there. But you do need to put in an initial depth in the pump start and stop. Speaking of that, 
even though it says initial depth, we have lots of people thinking that's an elevation. Nope, start and stop is an elevation, depth is a depth. So if you put in pump starts at 502, stops at 501, and initial depth is 502, you're telling me that there is a 502 foot column of water on top of that pump. So it may start, but it probably is not running well on its curve, right? Uh, so that's something that happens. Um, let's see. Specific uh, to kind of the pump modeling startup, there's a whole world of actually starting up a pump and shutting down a pump in reality. So this is a much smaller version. But if you're in the dynamic head world, you want to be careful that your upstream is not greater than your downstream. For me personally, I, it's confusing to me because I think of a pump pumping uphill, but of course it's pumping to the downstream node, it's just probably a higher elevation. But recall, if the upstream node is higher than the downstream node, then you don't even really need a pump, right? Like, then downstream minus upstream is a negative number, and no matter what your pump curve looks like, it isn't going to run. So a lot of times uh, people um, putting in their uh, pumps and not quite getting it that, that correctly and then hitting run and wondering why the pump never runs even though the wet well is joyfully overflowing. So that's another issue you might have. Final thing I'll say here, when we click here on pump type, this is where you input your data. Um, the model will, will do you a favor as it tries to infer what you're trying to do. So I mentioned at the beginning, try to get the best coverage you can for your expected flow. So if you have a dynamic pump, that's pump number three, and you have a pump curve, um, whereas you may think that you've got three points and the third point is not a zero, um, the model will just stop there and it will not extrapolate a number for you, it will just pin itself to the end. So if you have just kind of a design point, but under wet weather conditions you're running way further out on the flow, you're not going to get, you're going to get too much of a pressure. And that may be hard to, to see with that. I'm sorry I don't have something to visualize for you, but if you draw that little system versus flow curve and kind of trace it there, you really want to be able to cover as much as you can, even if it's just a, a good educated guess on what that might be. Okay, so we are way into it, and we've got like 10 minutes to do the wrap-up and demonstrations. You may say, why? Why would you do that? So here's a quote I have for you. Although, interestingly, I've seen the numbers attributed to Abraham Lincoln all over the map. So let's just assume it's eight hours. And the idea here is I had eight hours chopped down a tree. I'd spend six sharpening my axe. And I said this is the very beginning. A lot of times we find people are ready to model, and they're in it, and they're just plugging everything away, and they get to the pump, and they open up the pump dialog, and that's when they consider what's happening there. And I would submit to you that demonstrating and running a pump is very simple if you have the correct data. So the demonstrations I have for you are actually not very long at all because there's really not that much to show you. The pump either runs or it doesn't. So hopefully we've covered a lot of um, how to make the pump run correctly. So I have um, some demonstrations. The first one is just kind of the build from scratch demo. So this is to show you from completely blank canvas how can we get something that runs, right? No pressure on getting it to run right, but can we get something to run right in a couple minutes? And then I had this idea of working examples, and I knew I'd be low on time, so I'm going to let you choose. So since I already pestered you with three polls, now good luck. We'll see if this poll actually works and stays open. But I'm going to launch for you a question, as many as you want. I've got five different demos, um, notwithstanding a, uh, me doing a demo from scratch. So you vote and tell me what you want to see, and we will go in order until we run out of time. Uh, I can guarantee... I can, Presuppose one of the questions here will be, why didn't you go into more detail about whatever pump is interesting to me as a person? Um, and I will say that I don't have time to get over all of them, unfortunately, and also kind of give you a, um, a shout out for considering training. If you have a very specific example for you that can't be covered in um, a support ticket or otherwise, uh, we are more than happy. In fact, we have modules that stretch out for an hour, two hours, four hours, just on pumps. So if you want to know more than you ever really wanted to know about pumps, we can make that happen. All right. So I'm going to close in the interest of time, and I'll share the results. So we've got dynamic head pumps, variable speed pumps, and force mains. So I'm going to try to get through those three. Sorry, remote depth control pumps and static head pumps. Appreciate, um, appreciate your... Uh, interest there, but we're going to go, we'll start with dynamic head, that was number one, then we'll do variable speed and force mains, and hopefully we'll get that done in time. So all I did here was go to new from uh, template, and then I'm going to kind of cheat a little bit and use a sanitary template, right, which we have sanitary templates available, 
and here we go. Nothing is really going to give us there. Let me load a um, a little background so you have something to kind of uh, show yourself off of. All right, there we go. So nice simple. So this is a good example where you may see, for a simplified example, let's say everything drains down and we're going over a high point here into a creek, right? So real simple. So what are we going to have? We're going to have, this is going to be our storage. This will be our wet well here. And I kind of feel like uh, Bob Ross here. We're pretty little wet well here. And then we're going to have um, a uh, sealed junction here. And then we'll go gravity to an outlet, let's say, here. Okay. Um, so let's start with our uh, storage. When I double click this, I'm in hydraulics mode. It's just going to be a manhole. I click storage, I'm off to storage. Okay. If my math serves me right, a 10 foot diameter, this is real simple, but a, a 10 foot diameter um, cast in place manhole, which you saw in the very first example, I think is something very roughly like 80 feet. So that's saying every foot gives me 80 feet of, uh, of area, right, as we're kind of moving up in here. Real simple, um, simple there. And I'm going to say I surcharge at ground. Um, you have the ability to actually surcharge at the buried manhole. Remember, there is a manway or a little access point. So if you have something like that and you want to model that, you can do it. But I don't care that much on this level. Hit OK. I'm going to hit OK. And I turn from a, a circle to a triangle there. Uh, OK, I'm going to turn this off for just a second so I can see what I'm doing. So what I'm going to do, uh, a pump is what's called a multi-link. So it's a conduit because it makes flow. Um, Double-click there, so now I have this uh, multi-link here, and I want to pump. So I'm going to click a pump. Notice this is kind of nice. You don't need to arbitrarily split up if you have six different pumps. It can still be one multi-line, which is kind of nice. So we'll do pump one. We have the pump there. We need to give it a name, name the pump after myself. We'll use the default, the dynamic head. That's the one everyone wanted. Um, and so, again, we need to have a pump start and stop. Um, let's say that the pump starts at, let's say, 85 feet and it stops at 83 feet okay so it starts at a higher level once it drains down to 83 it turns off ideally theoretically water will get back in and raise it up on and off again makes sense um, and so when we could say an initial depth of let's say 10 feet so now we need to put in the pump type so none of this stuff matters we don't don't care about that you're done with it now we need the pump type so we're gonna make a new one this is uh, let's just say it's pump one. So if you had several pumps that were different, I'm going to make pump one, add that, and then edit it. This can be confusing. Um, this is basically your one-stop shop for everything related to a pump. So you can see here you have flow rate. That's one thing that doesn't change. But over here, this is kind of whatever it is. Maybe it's depth, maybe it's head, maybe it's volume. So don't be confused by all those different things. It's whatever you choose. So since we want a dynamic head, we know this is going to be flow and this is going to be head. Pretty simple. Um, Someone yell at me over here if you don't see Excel. Uh, this is a, I was talking to someone here. They thought this might be useful. Um, really simple way, uh, and this is in the pressurized pipe world, um, of getting a three-point pump curve that covers all of your edge cases. The idea here is if I have a flow rate of, say, 250 gallons per minute and a head of 100 feet, that's my design point here, right? That's kind of what I want. Um, that at four-thirds the head, it will shut off. So if I do four times 100 divided by three, and I have no flow, right? That's that number up here. And I can also, if I double the flow, I run off my pump, so I have no head. So I took one point and turned it into something that covers everything pretty simply there. Uh, just for reference, if I assume a, an efficiency, that would be like a seven horsepower pump, right? So not a lot of flow, uh, not a lot of head. So if I convert that to uh, a cubic feet per second, I can enter that in here as zero. This is real rough, right? 0 0.6, uh, 1.1. And that was for uh, 133, 100, and 0. So there we go. Right There's the same curve we just saw. Nice and easy. Get that in there uh, and select it. So now we have pump 1 in there. Everything's good there. We'll hit OK. Now I said uh, pump was on at 85. So I'm going to set this to um, 80 feet. So the bottom of the well is 80 feet. And I'll set the overflow at, let's say, 95 feet. All right, uh, so last thing here, we're going to go ahead and seal this little manhole so that we don't flood. That happens a lot, too. People forget to seal the most downstream manhole, and so your pump does a really good job of blowing a fire hydrant's worth of flow right out of the manhole downstream. We don't want that. Yep. Let me uh, draw this gravity line here, 
and I'll make him disappear. Helpful note, F3 will bring this up. Um, and so now I'm seeing both uh, upstream and downstream. So let's just say um, that I'm going to go, just to keep it simple, 100 and 100. Um, and a diameter of 1 should be fine. And let's say, I'm going to change it. Let's say we pump up to 100. Um, and this goes down to, say, 90, 10 feet over 200 feet. Yeah. It'll be simple, 2,000, right? Long, long, but we'll do it that way. So, um, and then the last thing we'll do is we'll make this an outfall, real simple, free outfall. So this pump is going to do a nice job of pumping. Final thing I'm going to do to try to load this thing is do a quick dry weather. I'll edit this, um, and I'll do direct flow, 1CFS. Because I use the sanitary template, I actually have a temporal variation for me. Um, so I will, uh, I'll show it to you. But it looks like that, just a nice, simple. So I select that, hit OK, OK, OK. Um, and I believe if uh, everything is to plan, I will be able to run this, let's see, always save no matter what you think. Let's see what happens. Let's see if we get close. I'm trying to run, the default is to run for a day. So we'll run for a day and see if we get any flow. So here's some flow in the downstream conduit. So you can see, remember we were at 1 CFS, or uh, 0.5 CFS was our normal operating point, right, in the curve we just made up. This little friend over here, we were said 0.5 and 100. So 0.5 is down here, so this thing is running uh, up higher. So it's running further on the curve. And this is a completely made-up example, but even in this example, I'd say, wow, you're, you're up on the curve, so um, perhaps the curve isn't correct or you're not running ideally. You can also show the results of the pump itself. You go here um, and look at the, at the pump, so you can see how the pump's running. And then uh, finally, you can run that and see what happens. Here's the wet well, right? A little bit of flow, my journal patterns, throwing a lot of flow in there. Overflow is at 100, so never overflow. You see this nice little curve. You can tell when the pump's on, when it's on. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the, the quick and dirty of a pump. Um, uh, see here, and you can kind of see that also if you're running here where the pump's down here and we're pumping up and down. So. Again, there's not too much to the demo of, like in this case, a dynamic head pump. There's just not, the pumps are so interesting to see. If you ever get the chance to go tour one, they're fascinating. In a model, they're kind of kind of boring, unfortunately. Okay, um, right at 12, so I'm going to um, very quickly just show you where um, where two things are. You want to see force main. I'll show you force main and the variable seed very quickly, and then we'll finish. So for force main, if I click on this pump, it's actually over here as a special pump and it's down here, and here you can enter in information about the head loss, and this is how you run a force main. Quick note about the force main is you're actually taking the force main and the pump as one big section. So if this wasn't a force main, it would probably look, if it wasn't run that way, if it was run like a normal Priestman force main, it would probably look more like this, and then you'd have some section here that's sealed. So you're combining those together as one. Sorry for that being quick, but that is the option there. Um, and then variable speed, there's there's two ways to do a variable speed. The one way is with the um, special, um, different special. Here you see there are five different pumps. They all have different pump settings, but they're all representing one pump. And then through this special other, you're telling it it's a variable. You're basically telling different pumps to turn on and off as you're running that way. So that's kind of the quick way um, that we can run that. Sorry for running over on time. It would be uh, good for everyone's time because I know you want to have the, um, the end here. You can get the... PDF. So quick summary, um, in form, reality, and model are nothing the same. In function, our goal is to get reality as close to model. So again, consider training. I know we have a St. Louis training coming up with spots available. We'll be covering this, um, but then we always have training available, and we can do remote training too. We also have knowledge-based articles in the support portal if you have specific, more targeted questions. Final webinar is coming up next. Um, you've had the opportunity to ask questions. Feel free to shoot me an email if you have a, a different question to ask or an offline question to ask, and I will jump off and help answer any unanswered questions that have cropped up during the webinar. Appreciate the time. Sorry for scooting a little bit over. Um, and for the frenetic finish there, I got too uh, knee-deep in my own from scratch demo.